Well, welcome everyone. We are so excited to have you today. So uh, thank you for joining us for the 2021 AUA Medical Student Forum. And it is my pleasure to introduce myself and our panelists. So I am Marissa Clifton, and I will be uh, the moderator for the session this evening. And I am so excited to be here. I'm an associate professor at Johns Hopkins and also the residency program director. And um, I'd like to move on to our next panel um, member. We have Dr. Ashley Johnston, and she is a pediatric urology fellow at Indiana. And so it is our pleasure to have her join us as well. Our Next panelist is Dr. Mobin Mirza, who is an associate professor in the Department of Urology at the University of Kansas, and he also works closely with the SAU. He is also a residency program director. And we have Nick Tadros, Dr. Nick Tadros, uh, joining us as well as an assistant professor um, at S Southern Illinois University School of Medicine, and he's the director of men's health. And he's also a surgery clerkship director. And so our final panelist, last but not least, is uh, Dr. Jennifer Gates, Assistant Professor and Vice Chair of Academic Affairs at University of Massachusetts Medical School. So we have a wonderful panelist today, as a set of panelists today, and we encourage you to get social on social media. So if you have Twitter, use the hashtag AUA21. Um, and then also remember to tag the American Urological Association if you have a chance. So throughout this webinar, we ask that you get engaged. And so you can actively participate in multiple different ways. And so there's a way to join the live discussion by clicking on the live discussion in the lower right corner and uh, basically engage in the conversation. The chat box is open and an excellent way for you to bring uh, up your questions and communicate and engage. So uh, I'd like you to take a quick second to review the learning objectives. We are going to talk about the medical student components to the application, and we're also going to maybe highlight some of the issues we've had during the pandemic. So we are going to uh, be bringing on all of our uh, wonderful panelists to help answer your questions, and we are excited to do this in a live format. So again, keep things going and have the conversation moving, and we're going to bring the panelists on screen in just a second. Wonderful. And thank you all so much for joining us today. I think this is going to be an amazing panel. Um, so we are all going to be uh, going through these questions, and these are pre-selected. And I'm going to give all of our panelists an opportunity to kind of give you their perspective. So we will uh, keep on time because there's a lot of good information to cover. And so uh, let's get started with our first topic. So I'm going to start out um, with uh, Dr. Mirza, and we're going to highlight some of the medical student clerkship experiences and essentially how we're going to optimize that. So the first question that I have for the group is, uh, starting with Dr. Mirza, how can our medical students get the most out of their fourth year clerkship rotations? Thank you, Austin, and to our joining us today. Thanks for joining us. Um, hopefully, we're able to. What can you get the most out of it? So, two ways. How do you perform well? Being prepared by uh, by being by yourself, the faculty member, and doing your best. It's review. Uh, you get to learn at it, and you get to interview instead of uh, um, the what you should get when you rotate the sides, and there should be um, a couple of the faculty and the program director members who uh, are an excellent letter. And, Participating. The other part is you don't know, get relationships with mentors. You uh, ears or help you got um, meditations. I suggest that institution great help to me. Some of the ways you can get the. Okay, and Dr. Tadros, do you have anything that we can add to what Dr. Mirza said? <laughs> a little hard to hear them because of that 
the audio connection. Um, but no, I mean, I think uh, the biggest things that I recommend for my residents, and, and kind of backing up what Dr. Mears has said, is um, really to read a lot, prepare for cases, and um, just be helpful. I think uh, I like it, and, and the residents, my other faculty, like it when residents, or sorry, when when medical students. Uh, seem involved and are really trying to help however they can. So whether that's moving a patient in the OR, pre-rounding to get vitals, um, anything like that to just be a part of the team. And we know sometimes it seems like insignificant stuff, but most of us notice uh, when you're going the extra mile to really try to um, make a difference on the team. Yeah, I think that's excellent. Dr. Yates, anything that you can add to how our medical students can get the most out of their fourth year clerkship? I think you're on mute. <laughs> I am. Thank you, Dr. Clifton. Um, so I echo the uh, comments from my colleagues. Um, I think we're all in agreement about that. It, the being helpful is so critical. I think it's not only appreciated by the residents, but the faculty notice that and the nursing staff. And a lot of times when we're ranking um, uh, students and trying to decide who to bring into our program, really it's the fit. And it's um, that kind of intangible part of the, the whole um, I guess, experience of working with a student, of really getting to know them and also knowing that they're part of the team. So I think some of the reason all of us are drawn to urology is just that team mentality. And I think is very collaborative uh, specialty. So the personality is, is so critical when we're looking for someone to match into our program. So helpful and um, collegial uh, is really critical. I think also before you start your rotation, talking to the program director or the clerkship director can be helpful just to kind of get an idea of the objectives. The, your best resource always remains the residents though, because they really have um, another finger on the pulse of, of what um, they expect. Every program has a different culture, of course, so different expectations for different, for different uh, programs. Uh, excellent. So um, I guess, do you have any study resources that you recommend for our students so that they can really hit the ground running? I, I, what, did, what do you recommend when a student says, how should I read and study for urology? Is that for me, doctor? Absolutely. Excellent. I love it. So I'm going to put a plug in for the AUA, of course. Um, and, and I don't, I'm not just saying that because this is an AUA webinar, but indeed one of your best resources is the core curriculum, which is available um, once you're a member of the AUA. The medical student curriculum is also excellent. It doesn't have quite as much um, detail for some of the, the um, topics that you're going to see on your rotation, um, but it's still an awesome place to start to get a good overview of uh, urology. But then if you want a deeper dive, then the core curriculum is fantastic. I think all of us have used Weeder. There's a new uh, version. Um, so that's kind of not necessarily the most scientific and vigorous um, resource out there, but the residents and medical students often like it for kind of succinct uh, pieces of information um, when they're about to, to scrub in a case. Um, and then guidelines. I, I I think if you really use the resources that are online, the European Urology, the AUA guidelines, there's a lot of great information embedded in the prelude, so the introduction, and you can get kind of an overview of whatever condition you're seeing, whatever you're um, potentially scrubbing an OR case, you can kind of get a good overview there. So that would be my, my kind of um, big picture view of where students can go for, for resources. Wonderful. And Dr. Johnston, do you have anything to add to, uh, to that list? Uh, to that list, I, I think Weeders is always a go-to for everybody, and I know he just released an updated version, which is very <laughs> exciting for all of us. Um, the other thing is that uh, Campbell's, while it goes into a lot of really excruciating detail about things, is still a really good resource, and you can check with your university, um, because I know it's free um, through a lot of university libraries as well, too, so that's another uh, great thing to check out, too. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, I think uh, Campbell Walsh is a gold standard, but it's sometimes a little difficult to slog through. But for points and important aspects, I think it really covers the material very well. Um, so Dr. Tadros, I was uh, wondering what your opinion is for our medical students that are seeking actively other rotations during their fourth year. What do you recommend to the urology applicant if they have elective opportunities outside of urology? Uh, so I think uh, this is a big deal. I think it's really important to do rotations outside of urology. Uh, one is because it's the last time you're ever going to be able to see these specialties uh, in any sort of in-depth uh, way before you become a urology resident. And two, I think you can get a lot of valuable skills. 
Um, so some of the rotations that I recommend or think that are helpful uh, are some other surgery rotations, specifically like plastic surgery uh, and general surgery. Uh, both of those are areas where urology has a lot of overlap uh, in, and so I think it's good to get comfortable with what they do, how they do things, and, and learn from them. Uh, and then other sort of non-surgical specialties that I think are really helpful would be something like an ICU rotation, um, especially in this day and age where urology residents aren't doing as much ICU training during residency. I think the more you can get that, the better. Um, and then a plug would probably, another plug would probably be for uh, something like nephrology. Probably all surgeons should take it. Uh, because as urologists, you know, the dirty secret is that we don't really know anything more about nephrology than any other surgeon does. Um, and yet we sort of have a lot of overlap with them, obviously. Um, so I think uh, that can be a helpful rotation as well. It's one that I wish I took during, res or during uh, medical school. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, let's move on to our next set of questions. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about research and um, I'm going to start with Dr. Yates. So, Dr. Yates, um, how do these programs look at research productivity? Are we looking at numbers of publication, first author publication, impact factor? What are the things for our medical students to think about regarding research? Sure. Um, so I think what's important for applicants to keep in mind is every program is different. Um, so some programs are, are very research heavy and have great resources and really value that in their applicants. And um, I will value more what you mentioned, the journal impact factor, that being a first author on urology specific uh, manuscripts, perhaps MD, PhD um, is a big appeal to some programs as well. So I think knowing your audience as a medical student, perhaps applying to programs that are a good fit for you as far as your research interests go. We just recently had an amazing MD, PhD student here. And that was one of her goals is to match into a, a residency program that would allow her to do some research. So um, I think that that's very important is, is to know, know thyself and know your program. Um, and then uh, I think what a lot of uh, program directors and faculty are going to look at is um, what we all consider important. So first author, urology uh, publications, what journal did you present abstracts? Some of the more nuanced uh, components that I think we all consider is did somebody follow through on a project? So if you have 15 abstracts and you haven't had any manuscripts um, during your your tenure in undergrad res, uh, medical school, whatever, whatever time period we're looking at, then I think that that um, isn't quite as favorable as somebody who may have fewer um, items on their CV, but have shown follow through and have perhaps prepared a manuscript and have submitted it and had it accepted or um, even is just in, in submission right now. So I think a lot of different components come into that to consider what really is important. I, I think sometimes students feel very rushed and feel an urge at the last minute to say, oh my gosh, I want to do urology. I need to find something to do. And they may commit to a couple of projects just to put it on their CV. And I think if you have a history, um, even if it's other specialties where you really were committed to doing research and quality research and people can vouch for you and say, yep, they were reliable. They followed through on the projects. That's more meaningful than a lot of the other um, factors that we consider. Yeah. Absolutely. And Dr. Mirza, do you have any other comments about resident research and how to approach it? Sometimes, can you guys... Oh, no. <laughs> the connection's slow again. <laughs> no, it's not. I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dr. Dr. Tadros, do you do you have any thoughts on on research? Like when you're reviewing these applications, what are your uh, what are your thoughts? What do you value? What should our applicants be, be thinking about? Yeah, I mean, I think Dr. Yates really summed it up uh, really well. I think the only other thing I would add is uh, occasionally we get applicants, uh, and I'm you know I, I was a, a general surgery resident and switched to urology, so I totally understand this point of view. But occasionally you get someone who maybe is sort of a late uh, bloomer into urology. And so I think for those applicants, just seeing the same things uh, that were just mentioned, but maybe in a different specialty. So yes, maybe they don't have any Roger publications, but they have four first authored publications in ophthalmology because that's what they thought they were going to do. Um, and then they switch later to urology. I think that can also be helpful um, just to show, to see that they've, you know, they've taken projects from the beginning to the end. Uh, and I agree as well with Dr. Yates that seeing uh, that completion to the end, um, you know, having a bunch of open-ended abstracts that have never been published or never been brought to fruition, uh, I think uh, is, again, a nuanced thing, but uh, important nevertheless. 
And Dr. Clifton, one other comment I wanted to make, if it's okay, is yeah. um, if there's an opportunity for a medical student to present at a meeting, whether it be um, the AUA, which of course all of us would love to present at, but uh, sometimes is a little less attainable, but we all need goals, um, or a regional meeting, so New England AUA, um, uh, Western section or a specific special subspecialty such as SUO, um, that's a really great opportunity to present an abstract. It accomplishes several things. First of all, you're doing research and that's obviously one of your goals when you're an applicant. It also gives you the opportunity to rub elbows with um, your own program, but also other programs potentially there. And I think the last um, benefit of presenting at a meeting, if you're able to do so, is you have a discussion point. When you're doing interviews, you're doing your urology um, interview Interviews, then you can say, hey, I was, you know, at the New England, I saw this, um, this awesome presentation of this, I know you were there. So it kind of gives you a kind of a common ground. And it shows without being too obnoxious and saying, look at me, I did all this, you're, you're kind of gently introducing the fact that you presented at a meeting, and it gives you sometimes um, interviews can come to kind of like a, a little lull, but it, it gives some more material for you and your interviewer to discuss some real um, material with merit. Absolutely. That's a fantastic point. And it's a great way to network, just like you said, mm -hmm. meet the programs, meet the people and see how great urology is, because I think we're all pretty fun people. So um, I'm excited that there's going to be this opportunity coming up at the end of the slide deck where you all can meet some of our wonderful mentors in urology. So more to come uh, at the end of the presentation. But um, I wanted to get Dr. Johnston's opinion on how we can make sure to optimize our medical students' productivity. You know, you work closely with residents, I'm sure. So how do you think they can they can kind of get the, their in to get research maybe done in a reasonable fashion? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I worked with the, I worked with a lot of med students actually when I was doing my research here at Duke too, um, which was a wonderful experience for me as a trainee too. Um, I think the earlier that you can reach out to either a resident or an attending. Um, and say, I have an interest in urology research and just schedule a meeting and sit down and talk about it. Um, I think is the best way to, like Dr. Yates was saying, kind of initially get your foot in the door, start to rub elbows even a little bit, use this as an opportunity to, for people to even just get to know you. Um, and you don't have to have a project in mind. You know, you don't have to come in hand with a proposal and everything laid out or know exactly what you want to do with the rest of your life. We're not expecting that. Um, but I think if you can understand what you can reasonably do with your time too. I think the hardest part or the it's kind of the saddest part sometimes with us as mentors and uh, I can say on the other side as mentees is, is um, saying yes to too many things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's a lesson I'm now learning too as a higher level trainee is that you have to be able to know what your expectations are of uh, from your mentor as well as what does your mentor expect from you? What can you get done in a reasonable amount of time too? So don't feel like you have to sign yourself up for every single project. Again, it's not so much about the qual quantity of what you're doing, it's about the quality and the quality, not necessarily journal impact factor, but what what does that project mean to you? How does that demonstrate your ability to get something across the finish line? How does that demonstrate your ability to be creative and um, uh, think ahead? And how does that demonstrate your ability and your eagerness to want to contribute to the field and be enthusiastic about urology? Those are all the things that I'm asking or trying to dig out when I'm interviewing um, applicants is not so much about the research itself as what did you get out of the research too? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Very good points. And moving on to our next question, because I think during the pandemic, we had a lot of students maybe not exposed to urology initially or able to do uh, away rotations and get exposure. So a lot of people ask me, what, you know, does it matter if it's in a different specialty? Is that going to greatly impact my ability to match? So I'm going to ask Dr. Tadros to weigh in first and then go to Dr. Mirza. Yeah, so kind of like I already jumped the gun and kind of mentioned this a little bit. Um, but no, I mean, I think obviously, yes, urology, if you can do it in urology, all the better. But um, again, what we're really looking for is not necessarily the actual data or the conclusions that you came to in your research, but the fact that you've done research, that you know how to do it, you know the scientific method, you know how to 
uh, revise a paper, you know how to submit a paper, all those things. Uh, and that's obviously the same across all specialties. Uh, and again, I think especially in this world of COVID, uh, where maybe uh, places uh, where who didn't have or students who didn't have home urology programs, uh, but couldn't travel anywhere because of COVID, or had to do some virtual rotations that maybe were less than um, you know ideal, uh, as we all know. Uh, I, I think uh, it's 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 totally fine. Um, and like I said, I think what most of us are looking for is that that you do research, that you understand research and that you're willing to do research because uh, as most of us can attest, that's uh, a very big part of being a resident um, is research. And, uh, and it's a big part of being an attending too, especially if you go into academics uh, like most of us uh, on this panel. So. so Dr. Mirza, any comments? If you can hear me, I have nothing to add to that. That was an excellent answer. <laughs> Mostly just check <laughs> the connection there. And I also want to just take a quick second to tell all of our uh, medical students listening, listen to what Dr. Tadro said. It is, uh, it is all about the process. And we as program directors and selection groups understand all of the limitations placed on you because of the pandemic. And so I think there isn't a program director across the country that doesn't understand that. So as long as the research is sound and you understand the methodologies, I think that's the most important aspect. So just take that weight off your shoulder a little bit. Okay, so we've covered a little bit on research and we're going to move to letters of recommendation because we are right now in the midst of when people are asking for letters of recommendation from their mentors. So starting off with uh, Dr. Johnston, um, you know, basically, how do you how do you construct a letter of recommendation? How have you seen it constructed? Sure. So I, the first thing I'll say is that it's important for you to understand this concept even early as a med student, although you won't be writing your own letters yet. Uh, once you are in the resident level, you will start writing your, or at least constructing an outline <laughs> for letters. Um, so I think the best thing for you as a med student to do again is to actually schedule a sit down meeting with the people that you're asking letters for that way again it's it's them having an opportunity to get to know you in this uh this protected time because it's hard when you're on rotations and we're in the OR and bouncing between clinic and seeing patients. They may not get the opportunity to ask you the questions that they need to ask you in order to write the letters. So coming in hand with your personal statement and your CV is good um, because often a lot of those things get mentioned. Um, even things that aren't necessarily medically related, you know, do you work on cars as a hobby? Are you, uh, you know, really into knitting and sewing? I know those things sound silly, but that those topics often get talked about during uh, match meetings. You know, what kind of skills do they have that not only demonstrates maybe technical skills, but also, again, dedication to long-term um, responsibilities, uh, dedication to long-term commitments and sports sports, things like that. So a lot of that kind of background history goes into your letters and a lot of that won't come out unless you take the time to actually sit down with your letter writers. Um, they'll uh, often poll uh, residents and, or, and also faculty um, from your rotation and ask them for feedback. And so feedback from other different people will often make it into your letters as well too, not just from that one faculty member. Um, so just take that in mind that it's it's often a good thing that it's not just the perspective of one person it's coming from a lot of different people that are adding to your letters too um and then they'll use some verbiage about you know how strongly they recommend you and that's sometimes just key ways for us to kind of uh read in between lines of certain things <laughs> to be honest but um the main thing is that they will talk about you as a person as well as you as a urologist. Those things are both equally weighted, I'd say, not only in your letters, but how we evaluate you when you're applying for residency too. And then um, Dr. Mirza, can you comment a little bit about the different types of formats that exist for letters of recommendation since you've read quite a few? So they're uh, excellent answer, by the way, um, for the first part of this. The the letters of recommendation, there, you know, there is a basic one where you just come up to someone and say, hey, would you write me an excellent letter of recommendation? This is how you want to state it. Um, and then they'll construct a letter which has prose basically and talks about who you are, where you went to medical school, 
hobbies, et cetera, and then their recommendation. Um, and then there are program letters or standardized letters. Um, for example, any student who rotates at our program gets a standard letter. And in the standard letter, there are various metrics that are being measured more objectively. So we'll rate you on a scale of poor to excellent. It's a five point scale. And it'll go through things like your interpersonal skills, communication, knowledge base. Um, if you do a presentation, how well do you did on your presentation? And it'll, it'll then ask us to rank you on a percentile rank, like how, where do you rank amongst your um, cohort? So we'll say top 10% or, you know, 15 to 25%, whatever the breakdown on the letter is. And at the end, we'll have a place to write um, much like we write in a regular letter. So these letters are more standard. They give the person who's reading your letter a more objective idea of what's going on. Um, and many people are starting to use that now. And as you go into asking for a letter, be clear about which one you're getting um, because you may have certain strengths um, for one letter or the other. You may strong, you may be very strong and shining when somebody just writes something that they know about you and how they recommend you rather than somebody who graded you. Um, so there may be very different ways to do that. I think as the field moves forward, we get away from step one scores and so on. It may be that all of us are using standard letters because we want to know some objectivity. So um, those are the two main letters. The third one is just a phone call, but that's not really allowed. <laughs> that's right. And 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 Dr. Yates, when um, you have when you're constructing these letters of recommendation, I want to bring up. Uh, this is going to be kind of out of left field, but I was thinking about it today. How do you compare programs that are pass fail now? Because a lot of the situation exists where our medical students are getting pass fail grades because of COVID. How is that going to impact this year's um, letter of recommendations that you write? Well, I, I think it's just kind of a trial for us to really um, be prepared for the coming years where step one is is no longer going to be an entity that we pass fail. So it's kind of forcing us to be a little bit more um, innovative. And I think uh, there's been a just a, a general um, groundswell of support for holistic interviewing, right? We hear this all the time, not just in urology, not just in medicine, but in a lot of different fields, um, this, this desire to increase diversity and to really um, take into account other factors that the applicant, um, their their real skill set and their attributes that isn't really captured with pass fail. So I think we're going to rely a little bit more on the letters of recommendation. I think that's going to be a huge one. And I know all of us um, program directors probably really put a lot of weight into the, to the letters of recommendation. And we kind of try to read between the lines and get a good feel. So I think that's going to continue to have a lot of um, real power for, for going forward for assessing our medical students. And then, um, without the ability to look at the, the, the grades for their clerkships, I think that component will be less critical. I, I think looking at all these other pieces is going to be um, much more important for us going forward. Excellent answer. And so moving on to the next component of the letter of recommendation. So um, I'm going to ask Dr. Tadro, since he's had some experience outside urology, um, should our medical students be asking someone outside of urology to write their letters of recommendation? And do you think COVID has changed this at all? You're on mute. There we go. Uh, I think COVID okay. definitely has changed this uh, I changed everything really, uh, quite frankly. So when you are unable to get a urology letter, um, I think is, especially if, if, if you let the, the, uh, the programs know that either in the, whoever's writing that letter, I think that's important to know because I will say, uh, urology is a, we're a pretty small family in the grand scheme of things. And a lot of us know each other. Um, and we sort of expect quite frankly, to get letters from certain people at certain places. Um, so, you know, if you rotated, uh, somewhere, uh, where we know that there's, there's, uh, either we personally know someone or we know there's certain people there and you don't have a letter from any of them and you have a letter from a family medicine doctor, uh, that does put up some, some red flags. Mm -hmm. Uh, but again, I think that being said, uh, a strong letter of recommendation always helps. A couple of the best letters I've ever read have been from, uh, non-urologists. Uh, but I'll be honest and say that those are probably, um, kind of the minority. Uh, usually I think most of us, quite frankly, will, will look at letters from other specialties or from outside of the people that we sort of know um, with the um, 
you know, uh, a little bit different lens than, than the ones from neurology. But again, COVID has changed a lot of this. And so we do understand uh, that if you're unable to do those rotations or you're unable to, to, to meet with those people, uh, what that, uh, you know, what that means. And, and so we do take that into account as well. And, you know, one hybrid way of kind of echoing what you're saying um, about the outside specialist writing the letters, one kind of way to make that a hybrid letter of recommendation is let your letter writer know, um, especially if it's your program director or your chairman or a combination letter from the two of them, um, that there's somebody who may be able to really um, speak to your merit and your accomplishments during your medical school tenure and ask if they would reach out to them. Um, here at UMass, we have uh, mentors, longitudinal mentors. So medical students are assigned a mentor at the beginning. It's called a house mentor, the beginning of their first year. And they are mentored by that physician throughout their whole medical school uh, time. So they really get to know them well. Um, so when I write a letter of recommendation, I reach out to the house mentor and say, hey, you know this person better than anybody um, here at medical school, most likely. What would you like to say? And oftentimes I'll include a quote from them that really kind of captures the personality rather than the student having to separately reach out for another letter and then wonder, what do I do with this letter? How do I put it in? Do I send it to this program, not this program? Sometimes you can hybridize a letter if you're comfortable asking the, the program director or chairman to do that, chairperson. That's a great point. Um, so I'm going to ask Dr. Mirza just to weigh in uh, a little bit about uh, the letters of recommendation and how they're composed, but um, also just the number of letters of recommendation. I know there's some guidelines uh, through the SAU, um, but med students say, are, are, are two letters enough? So I think there's a, um, I think the general idea would be if you are able to based on getting good letters, having good rotations, good faculty members who have engaged with you, try to get three or four. Now, let's say you don't have a home urology program and you weren't able to do another rotation and then your limit, your, your exposure to urologists or somebody who can write you an excellent letter, which is per, you know, pertinent to urology is limited, but then two is good. Um, and I think in the, in the COVID times, we understand that. And as a result, the SAU, um, the Study of Academic Urology, has, uh, has said that this is fine. If you, are, you can have just two, and that's good enough to complete your application. It, I think most of us who have home urology programs, you have faculty members, five, six, up to 16 or 20, depending on where you are. So you should be able to get three letters, um, at least if you have a home urology program. Now, the quality of the letters has already been stated by the panelists is very, very important. So you don't want three letters just to fill in the blanks, two excellent ones better than two very good ones and one poor one, okay? So the quality of the letter is important. So two is a good number for this year. If you can get more because you've had exposure within your own faculty or faculty members outside of your institution, then three or four is ideal. Excellent. So Dr. Johnston, moving on to our next question regarding letters of recommendation. Um, how can our medical students ensure that they're getting a strong letter of recommendation? Because you can't read it. So how do you know what's being said? Uh, yeah, it's tricky. <laughs> the answer is you really don't. But uh, like Dr. Mears has said, I think you do need to use that verbiage. Will you write or are you willing to write me a excellent or strong letter of recommendation? And I know it, again, it sounds silly. And some of these things that we talk about during applications almost sound like you're playing games. But at the same point, this is a, a, honestly a polite and respectful way that benefits you. Because if a faculty member feels like they didn't get to know you well enough, or, you know, God forbid, they feel like they maybe got the wrong impression of you, um, they, it gives them the ability to kindly say no to you um, to say, you know, I think maybe you'd be better suited asking someone else. Um, and that's a good thing for you because you want a strong letter of recommendation. You don't want someone who is maybe unwilling to uh, not write a letter or someone who doesn't get to know you as well too. Um, the other recommendation that I often give my med students is ask the residents, who are the normal letter writers? Who are the people that often get asked um, every year by sub eyes or by the visiting med students? Because those are the people that are used to writing letters. And those are usually the letters that are the strongest for us to read as the, um, the interviewers, um, because these are people who 
understand how to write a letter that allows not only the applicant to shine, but the interviewer to get the best and most accurate representation of wh who that student is too. Um, and again, I, I, I put another plug in for sitting down face-to-face -face time, um, getting time to voice not only uh, what you have done during this rotation, but what your goals are, who, what do you want to become, you know, as a urologist, what excites you about urology, all of these things that go into your application and other parts, but should also be highlighted in your letters as well too. Cause like we've all kind of been insinuating, the letters are becoming more and more important as things become pass fail with regards to step one and grades too. Excellent point. So Dr. Yates, I have a kind of a, another interesting question to pose. Should our applicants be getting chair letters, even if they haven't worked with chairs? Or how would you go about asking which faculty to write your letters? That's a great question. So I think we look historically and um, historically applicants have a program director letter, a chair letter, and then if they do away rotations, there's there should be a letter from the away rotation as well. Um, I think there's a lot of right answers here, and it really depends on kind of how many faculty or how many letters you're planning to request. This year, obviously, there's only one away rotation for everybody, so you won't be necessarily garnering a lot of uh, um, letters of recommendation from a lot of away rotations. So you have a little bit more luxury to ask. Um, different faculty members at your own home institution. Um, so I think, um, first of all, trying to determine whether it's appropriate to ask the chair or not really is, is predicated on the fact um, that it may be ex expected um, at a program that the chair will write the letter even if they didn't work with you. And sometimes for them not to write the letter would, would um, be a little bit of an affront if this is kind of classically how they've they've managed the program and what they can do is get a lot of input from their faculty from the residents and then sometimes a combined letter of recommendation you can either solicit this or they can offer to write it for you so for instance if the chair hasn't really had a great opportunity to work with you um, but the program director has had great exposure and, and feels comfortable then you can write a combined letter that speaks to all attributes of the applicant um, and then I think the second part of your question was how do you decide which faculty and I think um, we discussed a little bit of that before, but um, making sure you've had some exposure to these faculty, you've worked with them either in the clinic or the operating room or a little bit of both, or even a history of working with a faculty member in the research setting is brilliant as well. So um, I, I think it's a fine balance of politics uh, a little bit when we're talking about a chair letter and making sure that we do the right thing, um, but also um, making sure that most of the representation of your letters come from folks who know you really well and, and can speak to your great attributes. And throwing a little bit of personal data in there too is great. And I think we talked about this a little while ago where um, I think Dr. Johnson, you had mentioned that when we sit and talk about applicants, a lot of times it's the kind of the, the factors that applicants probably don't think aren't that critical. You mentioned their hobbies and that, that is so true. A lot of times we'll, we can't remember exactly the applicant's um, characteristics except we'll say, hey, isn't that the person who went to Africa for three months and volunteered? And so those parts of your um, kind of your whole picture really come out nicely in a letter of recommendation. So feel free to share those with whoever's writing your letter. Say, you know what, I'd like to tell you a little bit about myself that you may not really get from the CV. If, if I could add one quick thing to that too, I would definitely echo that. And I think even to make it easy for overworked letter letter writers is to send them an email or have a little handout, kind of like a CV, but just like, hey, here are some points um, that you might want to mention. Because you know, even when we get to spend a fair amount of time with you, we, we don't get to spend hours talking about, yeah, you're three months in Africa or the fact that you're a professional cyclist before you came to medical school or whatever it is. Um, and so making it easy for the attending to write a strong letter, uh, I think goes a long way. And so if that's even just like, hey, here's a quick rundown of some of my uh, important attributes um, or things that you might wanna know about. Um, I'm always amazed to see this. I'm like, why didn't you mention this or that? Uh, like, oh, you know, it never came up. Um, so make it easy for them to write a strong letter. I love all of these points. And I, I, I think the audience should hear it. 
setting up a time to meet with your letter writers, I think is really important. And it, it does a couple of things. Yes, they get to learn about you, but it holds them accountable for actually reading your personal statement, reviewing your CV and talking about your experience on a sub uh, internship experience or research experience. I would also tell our medical students that if you know you're going to go into urology and you're doing urology sub I, ask the residents early and make sure you spend time with the people that it matters to spend time with. So the residents will help guide you even if you don't have kind of that idea of who the best letter writer is. But if you do it early enough, you can make sure you're in the OR. You can make sure that if it's a prostatectomist you're going to spend time with, you've watched the videos, you know the steps, and you've read the history and understand some of the basics. And if you really prepare for those um, events, then you'll be able to get that good letter of recommendation. I write a lot of combined letters with my chair here at Hopkins, and I really try to make it personal. So I have a list of questions just going off of what Dr. Tadros was talking about, I have a list of questions that I send to all of my medical students who want me to write a letter of recommendation in an effort not to just say, you know, why do you want to be a urologist? But I ask them about difficult situations that they've been through or something they've learned about themselves through COVID or something that they specifically want me to highlight in their letter that I may not understand how important it is to who they are, or what they're trying to become. And that gives me just tons of insight. And I can pull that information and basically put it right into a letter. So if you as the medical student come up with your list of questions that you think are important that they should know about you, I think if you help them do this, you will ensure a better letter of recommendation. Um, they can write great things about your grades. They can write great things about your rotation and experience. But I know as program directors, we're looking for people that fit into the culture, understand urology and want to help patients and each other. And so if I can find someone that really exemplifies that, I think that you know, I'm really able to write a very strong letter of recommendation. So these are just fantastic points. We should probably distribute it to all of our faculty members. Um, so we're going to move on to another topic, um, a little bit about uh, what, you know, basically pre-interview questions, what should you be thinking about? So the first question I am going to pose to Dr. Tadros is how can our medical students, especially since they're only able to maybe do one away sub I, learn more about specific programs? Yeah, obviously in the post-COVID world or COVID world where um, this is difficult, like everything. Um, but I think uh, many programs are trying to make it as easy as possible to learn about um about our programs. Uh, and I think one of the easiest ways is obviously to check their websites, um, their, you know, the official residency website or school of medicine website. Uh, and a lot of programs, including ours and some of the other panelists here, you know, have made videos uh, that are interviewing residents, um, interviewing faculty, uh, talking about the program, that sort of thing. So I think that's a good place to start. I think the other spot uh, is social media. Uh, so we uh, encourage our uh, residents uh, and our faculty to try to be as, um, uh, active on social media as they can, uh, either with like our official Twitter accounts or Instagram accounts, that sort of thing. Uh, and that can be a great source of information, I think, especially uh, to get a feel for sort of the, um, the personality of the program, uh, maybe kind of some of the behind the scenes stuff and not necessarily the, the facts, how many cases you do, this and that, but just what the residents are doing, what they enjoy doing, what they're seeing, uh, what they're doing uh, outside of work, that sort of stuff. Um, and then finally, I think if you can talk to people, uh, like I said, urology is a small world. So if you could talk to either uh, former students, uh, your co-medical students, residents at your home program uh, that are familiar, either trained or interviewed at other programs, I think that's a good source of information as well. Um, and then of course, there's the, um, I guess now the, as we mentioned before, the Google Docs uh, or the, the document that sort of keeps track that uh, a bunch of medical students have access to about various programs. It used to be on Urology Match, I believe. Um, and that uh, uh, can be a source as well. Obviously, that stuff's not official. That's just opinions of, of medical students. Um, but that can also be a good uh, source of information. So. To, to piggyback on that uh, regarding social media, um, I think it's also, if if you send direct messages, so if you find out who are the kind of the active Twitter people for certain programs, or even like uh, Dr. Tadras mentioned, the official Twitter accounts, um, direct messaging those people and asking questions about the program or even trying to say, hey, I'm really, really interested in your program. Is there any way we could set up a time to talk? 
more often than not, those people are very eager to talk to you as well, too, because they're on social media for that reason. You know, they want to put their best foot forward for their program. Um, so reaching out through Twitter or Instagram via direct message is a great way to actually get um, even more information, too. And then, uh, Dr. Mirza, do you have any comments about how we learn more about programs? Um, I think all the things mentioned are excellent. Um, I also, I posted on the link on the swap card, um, a link of all the dates for virtual open houses that many programs are doing. So that's a good way for you to learn about programs and engage with the faculty and the residents. Um, I, one of somebody mentioned direct contact and I want to just emphasize that more. Um, so if you are truly interested in a program, um, and you uh, you know want you want to be at the University of Kansas. I think it's helpful to go to our website, find out who the program director, in this case me or the associate program director, Dr. Kowalik, and just send an email saying, "Hey, my name is Joey. I'm interested in your program. I'm looking forward to the interview season. Sorry, I wasn't able to rotate with you. Here's my CV. Looking forward to hearing from you. Just something basic like that. And if there's something specific about the program that attracts you, like by the way, my dad just moved to Kansas City, so I'd like to be close to him." That would be a great thing to include. So I think contacts like that um, for you to be able to engage with the program, learn more about the program, learn about your candidacy with that program as you send these direct contacts is also very helpful. I'm a Twitter dummy. I don't follow the Google Docs unless somebody reports something on it. So, uh, but I think those are great resources because everybody uses them. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Such good points. And I, I think the SAU has a link to almost all of the programs uh, that are part of the Society of Academic Urologists. And so it can take you directly to the residency account. Um, the Google Doc is out there. We all know about it. Um, but all the medical students should be aware that the program directors do know about it and can access it as well. Um, and then some of it really isn't screened. I think if you are interested in a program, learning about that program and preparing for an interview with that program, really really kind of shows us your interest. So when I have an applicant that actually knows specifics about my program and can talk to me about what's on the website or has actually reviewed the videos that we've posted and some of the information that we have, it really sets apart the idea that you want to join our program and be part of it. So um, all of these are great ways to learn about amazing programs. And I just want to say that within urology, there are no bad programs. We really have a great group of wonderful programs that train exceptional urologists and we're lucky because our specialty really has protected that. So um, I think you all should get out there and, and read about these various programs. Um, okay, so moving on to the next important question, and I will start with uh, Dr. Mirza regarding how many programs should our applicants be applying to? So not 120. <laughs> um, I think a good number is close to 40 to 50, okay? I think every applicant is also different. So this is a good time when you are starting your application process to sit down with your mentor. Um, if you don't have a mentor, there are five people on this panel who would love to be your mentors. You can email us, you can contact us with the AUA uh, Medical uh, Student Committee um, emails um, and ask based on your application. Somebody can review your scores, your grades, your personal statement and give you an idea of how much you really need. An excellent applicant, somebody who's got um, you know, really high board scores, really excellent grades, done plenty of research, um, somebody who was an applicant like Dr. Clifton, um, probably just needs to apply to like 30 programs, probably good enough, because all you need to match is about 12 to 15 interviews, and you could probably get that if you're an excellent applicant out of 30 applications that you've submitted. I think in general, submitting past 50 to 60 doesn't really help you. Um, I think how you apply matters. So as you start making a list of applications you're going to send to, just don't click every box that you can send an application to. Again, sit down with your mentor. Figure out what your likes and dislikes are. Do you want to be part of a big program? Do you want to be part of a small program? Do you want a clinically strong program? Do you want a research powerhouse behind you in your program? Um, do you want to be in a certain geographic area within the country? Um, all those things will help you understand where you want to be. And you can build this list down. But, so we cannot limit the number of applications. I wish we could. Uh, but really, don't apply to more than 50, 60. That's, you don't need to. And it doesn't help you to do it, honestly. You're just wasting money. 
And Dr. Tadros, if you have someone come up to you and they ask, you know, how should I be ranking these or applying to these programs? Should I just be reaching for the stars? Should I just have all of these safety schools? How do you really help guide them as they're making their rank list? Yeah, uh, I think uh, it's a great question and uh, it's difficult to answer. I think part of it does depend on the strength of your application and hopefully either you've been able to do self-reflection and figure that out on your own or you've talked to your mentors to figure out um, kind of where they feel like you sit uh, in the in the grand scheme of things. But it never hurts. I think two things that you have to ask yourself is um, one, you have to really only apply to programs that you're willing to go to. And you have to say, would I rather go unmatched than go to wherever? Um, and and if the answer is no, I'd rather go to that program than go unmatched, then I think that you know that goes on your list. Uh, and I think in, with that in mind, I think you do apply to sort of all of those kind of programs. When you're applying to 50 or 60 programs, there's plenty of room to apply for your REACH programs, to apply for the safe schools, to apply for what you consider the middle of the of the road programs um but again you don't want to go to a program that you think you're going to be miserable in because i mean that's the worst way to start a very potentially difficult five or six or more years is off on the wrong foot where you're like man i didn't even want to go to this program like johns hopkins was the last on my list you know and um and so i think um i think that's important to, to keep in mind the the flip side of that, though, is that, uh, especially in neurology, uh, being a small world that we are, going unmatched uh, is can be difficult to recover from, uh, quite frankly. Um, and so you do have to keep that in mind uh, as well, uh, that if you don't match the first time around and you're going to apply for the match again uh, in the second year, um, it will be harder to match to any program. Um, and so you have to keep that in mind as well. And it's a balancing act. I think there's not a right or wrong answer. Um, but I think, uh, as Dr. Clifton mentioned, there really is no bad urology program. Even the, quote, safe schools or what you think, what you consider the safe schools are still good urology programs. Um, and so if it's your passion to become a urologist, um, you know, rank, rank those programs as well. Yeah, and so many of these programs are so different that if you figure out what you're most interested in, you know, five versus six years, geographic location, do I want a real community heavy practice? Do I want a big city practice? Um, those are important considerations as you're making your list. Um, so, so Dr. Yates, I, I want to ask again another tough question since I'm just coming up with all these ideas today. <laughs> Um, but I want to know how can an applicant who's never applied before really know where they fall within a list? Because it's hard sometimes for mentors to help people figure that out. Is there a piece of advice that you can give someone so that they can walk into this and be successful when they create their match list with not a false sense of where they're going to end up? Yeah, sure. That is a great one. And that's a tough one that I don't think any of us have answers to. But um, I don't want to start off on a negative tone, but I will as a word of caution for our medical students. Um, they may have heard of token, uh, the token system that was kind of being vetted. I think ENT, if I'm correct, is looking at that this year. And um, urology has decided, the SAU has said, we're not going to participate in that. We're going to see how things go with ENT. So a word of caution to medical students, I think that there's a um, there's a company out there that wants to sell tokens and it's um, we just have to be careful because we're not participating in that this year. So someday maybe that'll be a possibility. The SAU is really doing its due diligence and vetting that as a possibility down the road. But right now we don't have a program like that where um, tokens can be utilized. Um, Dr. Mirza, did you want to add to to that as an SAU representative? Um, I can let, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I'm sorry. Oh, that's, that's okay. You can finish your answer and then I can. Okay. <laughs> it sounds uh, good. I can specifically address the first part. of it. Awesome. That. Okay. That sounds good. Thank you. Um, so as far as kind of finding out where you fall on that, that rank list without really having a, a good handle on um, necessarily kind of what the, the program is looking for. It's it's not unreasonable to ask your mentors. Um, they can certainly uh, contact a program and say, look, I'm really interested. There's a very strict guidelines for 
contact after interviews. So we're going to be very respectful of that as program directors and faculty. Um, so the I want to say that the absence of communication from us doesn't mean that we're not interested in you as an applicant. It means that we're just following the rules. Um, there, there are uh, significant consequences if we try to reach out to applicants and, and bypass the system that's been put in place. Um, so those are kind of the two the two things I wanted to say off the off the bat. Um, but trying to get an idea of where your best fit is, I think just try to remember what that interview was like. What, what did you have a rapport with the residents, with the with the faculty? And I think if you felt like you had a rapport and you felt like that might be your place, there's a good chance that they feel the same way. It is absolutely reasonable to send um, a, a note afterwards, um, thanking for time. There is zero obligation and zero expectation, and and really um, discouraged to have. Uh, you know, second look interviews um, because we're trying to keep the playing field fair. Um, in this era, it doesn't really matter because it's virtual, but um, so it, it is a little bit hard to kind of figure out where you sit on the rank list, but um, using those resources and also just kind of the gestalt of how you felt when you had your interview can be very helpful. Dr. Mears, I will turn it over to you to augment my comment about um, preference signaling. Yeah, and I'm really sorry. I didn't want to. Oh, no. Don't apologize. Uh, I didn't mean to interrupt your answer by typing something in. Um, so as far as preference signaling goes, so uh, for this year, um, hot off the press, guys, stays within the 30, 40 of us in this room for now. <laughs> the SAU will have preference signaling. Um, and we will be having uh, webinars, I think, on the 16th and 19th of August. You will all get communication about that from the SAU, both on the student side coordinator side, director side, um, that will cover how we will go through that process of preference signaling. We'll run this through the AUA actually, so we will not be using any third party vendor. Um, the reason we haven't made a huge announcement yet is because we're still trying to figure out the, the technical IT type details. Um, so until we are sure that we can actually do this safely, we're sort of holding the announcement. So. Yeah, but look for announcements on that. We will have preference signaling for this year's MAD cycle. Um, so I think that will certainly help um, the applicant um, be able to signal programs that they like. Now, this is pre-interview. Um, so it doesn't really help you understand where you are on the rank list. But I think if you you know are allowed to signal three programs, say, for example, then those programs already know that you're interested based on your their previous interaction with you or your knowledge of the program for other you know reasons that that may be uh, obvious so just look out for those announcements i think another way um to sort of i don't think anybody can really know where you're on the rank list but as already said there's a there, you get a feeling and sometimes that feeling can be incorrect but you got to go with your feeling remember the match list and the rank list really favors the applicant okay so you write it the way you want it you write it the way you think is best and don't try to second guess about where the programs are going to rank you and I think in general, programs do the same thing. When we make our rank list, we don't say, oh, where do you think Jen ranked us? I mean, it matters a little bit, but no, we're not trying to really game the system. It sort of works itself out, and that's why there's a match process there. So my, my advice to all of you are making your rank list, again, talk to your mentors, okay? They can help you understand your, your strengths and all that um, in terms of how you, and you can present them your list. And second, write the list the way you want to see it for yourself, not the way you want to guess it to be. Oh, these are the, well, I'm so glad we were the first to learn about this. It's very <laughs> exciting about token signaling. Um, I, I want to just put in a couple more comments. So when you're making your application list, uh, places that you want to send your application to, I cannot highlight how important it is to be thoughtful about this list. Because if you're a certain type of candidate and you get a lot of interviews, you get overwhelmed and you're not sure where you want to go and what you wanted in the first place. So if you apply everywhere, you're not going to be able to kind of figure it out if you get a lot of interviews. So um, that's one reason to consider it. Uh, the other thing is if you aim at the wrong direction, you may not end up exactly where you want to be. And so one thing that I do tell applicants is reach out to residents that you trust. You form these relationships with these residents in urology, and you'll likely find one who's very honest, maybe brutally so. Um, and if that's the case, they can review kind of, they've recently gone through this process and give you a little bit of advice about what they're thinking. Now you do have to have an element of trust. 
in my program and with our medical students, I tend to be very open because I want their success to be uh, optimized. And so I give them my opinion and I talk about how we make sure to highlight their strengths. Um, and we go through that together and I help review some of the lists with them to make sure that we keep all of those components together. Now, again, not every program director or clerkship director is able to do that. Um, but if you can find a faculty mem member or mentor that you trust, I think it's so incredibly important. Mm -hmm. So I uh, think we should move on to the next question. This is such a great discussion. Um, and it's essentially, uh, uh, Dr. Johnston, what do you think is going to happen with this step one pass-fail scoring? How is it going to affect anything? I know we've kind of touched on it briefly, but what are your thoughts? I think it will really uh, affect the way that we look at applications. Um, from my understanding, a lot of programs have in the past used step one cutoffs to start to weed through applications. Can you um, tell us what you mean by cutoffs for step one? What is that? Sure. So a minimum score where you can actually basically, from my understanding, when you get all the applications in, a program director, and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, can uh, essentially filter um, applications by certain things. So for example, they can actually filter applications um, for graduation year. So say, for example, someone who's already graduated from med school who is potentially a reapplicant, um, they could look for those. And then they could look for anyone who has a certain step score above a certain level. Um, some programs even publish their minimum step one scores on their websites. I know my home program has done that in the past. So now with step one being pass fail, it is going to be challenging because it does, it, you know, programs get tons and tons of applications. And that's what Dr. Mirazo was saying is that a lot of us do wish that there was a maximum level of applicants that uh, applications that can be submitted to a, a place. Because um, it can be hard to, to kind of weed through applications and find the people that work best for us. Um, that being said, as someone who had a step one score that was on the lower side and below some of these cutoffs, um, that can also be disheartening. And there might be other ways that you um, can kind of circumvent that and get your application up to the top of the list. Um, and we can maybe address that separately. But um, I think now letters of recommendation are going to be the more important factor. Um, talking to everyone in different programs and different levels of academic uh, urology, I, everyone has now started to put more emphasis on the letters of recommendation. That being said, um, still study for step one. <laughs> um, you know, don't totally discount it because at the end of the day, you're also going to be taking exams for the rest of your life. <laughs> Whether you like it or not, that's the, I'm saying this is someone who just took their board exam uh, last month and I'm anxiously awaiting the score. So, uh, ex but, you know, Standardized tests, whether you like it or not, are a part, uh, an important part of how we um, get certified as physicians. So at least use it as a way just to get used to sitting at a computer for hours on end st staring at standardized questions. <laughs> and Dr. Gates, what do you think about step two? And do you think that's going to be a requirement or how should our medical student applicants think about step two? It's just hard to know right now how that's going to pan out. And I think a lot of um, kind of the the behind the scenes chatter is going to be, unfortunately, as much as we'd like to talk about holistic interviewing and looking at other attributes, I fear that may become kind of a stand in for step one. So it may not be required um, as of yet, but I think um, the culture is going to shift so that we start looking at that number just as, as Dr. Johnson had mentioned, is it's kind of a... Um, for better or for worse, sometimes we need it just a, a number to use to start screening applications. And a lot of programs do have minimum cutoff. So um, being brutally honest, I do believe that that's where things are going to go to some degree. And I hope there'll be a balance eventually where we're somehow able to filter through all of these um, applications and find the great candidates that are out there because really, we really have a lot of good applicants and numbers don't always necessarily mean everything. No, I think I think this is incredibly important. And I like to say that I review every single application personally that comes through regardless of step score. And I think all of the other programs out there are going to have to do something similar. And mm -hmm. that 
really your chance to shine with letters of recommendation, with your personal statement, with your hobbies. You only have a short little amount for hobbies, but I always look at that because yeah. that's where I can really see where some of that interesting stuff is. So um, I think this discussion is so important and um, we'll see how it is in the future. This is kind of a, a nice segue into the loss of step one uh, score. And essentially, you know, we have some pass fail grades. So we're going to learn how to balance, I think, more holistically the application. So more to come on that. Well, we uh, have really talked about the application process. And I think that our students want to learn a little bit more uh, about the career of urology. So we are going to do some career oriented uh, conversations in just a second. And um, let's start with our next question. And I'd actually like all of our panelists to answer this. Um, and I'll start kind of going on on my view and start with Dr. Yates and moving to Dr. Johnston and then Dr. Tadros and Dr. Mirza at the end. I have other passions outside of the operating room, including public health, leadership, engineering, hospital administration, global health, basic sciences. So how do I integrate this into, um, into my career? That's a great question for all of us. And I think the all of us here on the panel are really well poised to answer this question because um, we have a diversity of interests and a diversity of roles in our careers. But at the same time, it, we all have commitments to education, leadership. Um, so I, I think amongst um, the five of us, uh, we can give kind of examples of how we've really lived this. Um, urology is a great profession um, and it's probably one of the best uh, professions to be able to live all of these dreams. Um, when you think about it, where are we? We're in the operating room, we're in the clinic, we're in the emergency room, we're staffing patients on the floor. We live in every realm of the hospital. So we know the ins and the outs of how things work, um, what we like, what we don't like, um, where we wanna shine, where our passions are. So for instance, um, some faculty may have an interest in hospital leadership administration. Um, personally, not my favorite thing to think about, but uh, we, we really have a great opportunity for that um, because we, as I mentioned, we are in all these different spaces within the world of medicine. So very easy to get involved in the leadership in that respect because networking is just natural to all of us in urology. Um, and, and some of the other um, passions that you mentioned, I think uh, global health and basic science, I mean, what better field? I, of course, I'm not going to say anything, but urology is the best field, but um, global health, um, we have, you know, within the AUA, a, a whole uh, arm of the AUA that really is committed to outreach and uh, global health initiatives, um, basic sciences. Um, many of our programs, urology programs such as yours, Dr. Clifton, are renowned for their basic science research. So finding the right match for you as a, a medical student matching into a urology residency program um, is important. But even if you don't necessarily make the right match for your residency that's going to position you for the next part of your career, you can still make it work for you. you. And a lot of people, they launch out of residency, they find their first career and it isn't necessarily the right fit and you just work at it and you and it happens. Academia versus private practice, way too much of a topic to discuss now, but um, so easy in urology to 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 slide into either one of those career pathways and you'll be supported in, in any way that you need um, amongst urology peers for that. So I think um, that's kind of my bottom line is what better specialty than urology to be able to do any of these things um, that we want to do or none of them. There's no pressure if somebody wants to go into private practice and simply do their job and go home and, and have um, a little bit more of a robust home life that is absolutely doable as well. So I think we're very lucky in this specialty to have a breadth of options to us. Yeah, I think the, the, the great thing about being a medical trainee is that there are so many opportunities for you to get involved in these things early on. And more importantly, there's a lot of financial support for you to get involved in these things. So for example, um, as residents, you um, can get grants through the AUA to go on global mission trips through IVIU. I've had a lot of co-residents who've done these incredible trips to Mongolia, um, doing surgeries there. And I think they learned an infinite amount of skills on their one week in Mongolia that they did on <laughs> sometimes certain rotations here at home too. Um, the, uh, for example, I also got involved with advocacy, which is something I started mm -hmm. to kind of dip my toe in through the AUA. So I got 
got a grant through my AUA section to go to the AUA Advocacy Summit a couple of years ago. And we were on Capitol Hill and we met with um, Senate committee members and were, you know, vouching for bills for men's health. And again, that's because I was a trainee and I had the opportunity to be financially supported to do that, which is great. So um, the time during your training is so wonderful because you have everything at your resource now and you have the support from all your faculty and to do these sorts of things. So try out as many things as you want during residency. I know it seems like you don't have the time a lot, but you will be supported to make the time to do these things. Um, and if you see yourself in a doing a career that's kind of multidimensional like that, um, like Dr. Yates was saying, I would probably look at programs um, that have a robust university associated with them. So places that have the undergrad campus close by um, or the engineering school close by, it's just so you can actually see that there's a lot of faculty members probably already have um, working relationships with those people doing research with the engineering department or, you know, taking a, a public health course or doing a leadership master's course. I mean, it's incredible what all these programs have. I mean, here I actually just started a medical educator training program for residents and fellow here at Indiana University. So again, there's just infinite amount of opportunities. And once you start talking to people about your interest in things, they'll recommend things to you as well, too. And I think you're right about that, Dr. Johnston, as far as the AUA opportunities go, we're really lucky to have such a active um, uh, group amongst the AUA who are really pushing for our young urologists to be involved. There's, um, you mentioned the AUA summit, um, and there's so many other opportunities, the young urology uh, committee, the AUA leadership, there's so much that the AUA does for us. And we're very fortunate to have such an active uh, national um, group that is is providing these opportunities for us. And I would echo a little bit about what Jen said too, is that um, as urologists, we're uniquely qualified to be in leadership or, or be in, in all of these different areas. And honestly, you know, if you want to be CEO of a hospital system, there's a urologist out there that's doing that. If you want to be head of a global health initiative, there's a urologist out there that's doing that. Um, really urologists uh, can do really, you can really do anything you want. Um, unlike uh, Dr. Yates, uh, I am a glutton for punishment. So I am interested in like hospital administration <laughs> and leadership stuff. Uh, so uh, there's opportunity for that. I did my MBA a few years ago. Uh, because because that's what I wanted, you know, was sort of passionate about. And so there's always opportunities uh, like that, either to get more advanced degrees, uh, to augment uh, these things, or just uh, oftentimes, quite frankly, just showing up and saying that you're willing to help uh, goes a long way. Uh, but yeah, I think uh, as urologists, you could really pursue these other um, professional uh, interests outside of, you know, just operating and seeing patients. Um, and there's good opportunity through the AUA, good opportunity through your peers, uh, and like I said, there's someone, if there's something that you want to do, there's already a urologist out there that's probably climbed to the top of that mountain, uh, which is fantastic because they just uh, have sort of paved the road for the rest of us. I don't have much to add to that, except I'll say that it's all possible. All the opportunities are there. Um, you know, you're already becoming a physician, whether you become a urologist or not. Um, you're already in a position to affect change in your communities and in, in your society um, for people who you uh, touch in your clinic or your neighbors or your churches or your mosques, wherever you are helping out. There is so much to do out there. There's a lot of good work to do out there. And physicians are uniquely positioned, uh, both in terms of leadership abilities, resourcefulness, financial abilities, um, to be able to affect those changes. So there, everything that's listed there be inspired to do all of those things. I, I will find you mentors within my own department and everybody on this panel will find you mentors within their department who can probably checkbox every one of those things that's listed in this question. And they have done it all and they've done it all well. So um, it is our responsibility to actually do these things to not just be focused on you know the one clinic patient. Obviously you wanna take care of that patient, but we have a broader responsibility on our shoulder. I joke with my kids, I tell them, I'll pay for your college education if you become a doctor. And they always laugh at me and they say, dad, well, why don't we get a choice? And I say, you get a choice, you do whatever you want. But if you want me to pay for your college, you're gonna go become a doctor. 
Um, my niece is seven years old and we were in uh, Austin last week and she said, well, she calls me, Bhaiya, I want to do so many things. I want to be a doctor. I want to be an actor. I want to be a teacher. And I said, become a doctor. You can do all of those things when you're a physician. You can do all of those things when you're a urologist and you're uniquely positioned to do all of those things. So take responsibility for that. I think this is not just a, can I do this? Is this possible? You should do this. It's your responsibility to do this. You owe this to the world. I think these are wonderful answers. And from being a program director, I know a lot of program directors are focused on ensuring that we have a more expansive and comprehensive educational component to our residents. So a lot of us have professionalism curriculum with wellness curricula and all kinds of things kind of roped in to get you exposure and experience. And um, I, like Dr. Tadros, I'm a glutton for punishment and I do a lot of program building and that's actually my passion. Yes, I love education, but I love to build programs. And I didn't even know that about myself until I happened into urology and then started working with the residency and said, wow, I'm pretty good at this. And it became a real passion of mine. I also do safety and quality, which is an incredibly important aspect. You know, this is our reimbursement. This determines what we're going to get paid. It we're tracking metrics across the country based on quality. So having a deeper understanding is so important. And in my program, we've actually developed a role, um, a uh, chief resident for safety and quality who works alongside me in a lot of our departmental quality initiatives. So depending on what your interest is, you can find someone probably within the own department that you're applying to or that you want to go to that has some experience or we'll at least have connections to get you that exposure. So all of us are thinking about it broadly. And it's not because we want you to do more than you can. It's because we recognize how important this is for the field of medicine and for your development as a professional. So don't think, oh, I'm overwhelmed. They want too much of me. There's just too much going on. It's not that at all. We want you to have a balanced professional life so that you can be fulfilled and you can excel at the areas that you wish to excel in and that you're good at. So this is just to show you the amazing potential that's here within urology, not to overwhelm the people listening, because I think sometimes we say, how am I going to get to that piece? but it's amazing with support of your colleagues how much we can accomplish in the field of urology is a perfect example of that. So um, moving on to our next question, I think we have time for one more. So what if I'm deciding between career, uh, career in urology and another field? How do I know if urology is a good fit for me? We've answered some of this, but I'd like Dr. Johnston to just say, how did you know you wanted to be a urologist? How do, how do we help the medical students realize that? I, so I kind of answer this question a lot with med students. And the, and the funny thing is that you, I mean, I never would have guessed that I am somewhat I'm passionate about the bladder. I mean, how do you know that when you're becoming a doctor when you're 16 and saying, yes, I want to, I've become a doctor, but there's, there's certain pathology that you just end up really bonding well with. Um, and that, that sounds a little crazy, but it's true. I mean, I, for some reason, like, you know, the heart is incredible, but it just, it never got, it never got my juices flowing <laughs> or the brain. I mean, there's, I think the main thing is obviously making sure you feel like you fit well in the culture of that environment. Cause every specialty does have a certain reputation. And some of that is really based in reality um, about what the culture is like in that. So that's important, you know, liking certain procedures is important, but at the end of the day, if, you can be a technician and you can enjoy doing a procedure, but a large portion of what we do in urology is still clinical medicine and taking care of patients in the clinic. And if you're not passionate or at least really interested or intrigued by some of the pathology in urology, um, you know, about the kidney, about cancer, about reconstructive urology. I mean, the, the nice thing about urology is there's so many different ways to come at it um, and so many different aspects that people can find interesting. Um, so I think starting with even just, is this pathology, are these disease processes interesting to me? Um, and then for me, it was knowing about the fit. I mean, I think urologists are people that like to like to tell a good joke and like to keep things light in the operating room, which I really enjoyed right off the bat. Um, and the variety that we do. I mean, I think that's why all of us go into it. That's why every med student will answer that during their interview. And that's fine if that's your answer too, because that's true. I mean, doing robotics and then doing a big open case and then doing a, a really amazing reconstructive case and doing that all in the same day um, is incredible. It's an incredible opportunity. So if you like variety um, and you're passionate about the pathology, um, I think that's a good place to start. 
And Dr. Mirza, why did, how did you decide to be a urologist and what guidance can you give for our medical students who are contemplating urology? So don't follow my example. Um, I was an engineer before I became a urologist and I basically met somebody who I wanted to be like. So I emulated my whole career to this day after this person. So if you find a good mentor you wanna be like, be like them, whichever field that they're in and you'll be happy. Um, I think if you are not sure about urology and this, you, I mean, if you're a third or fourth year, it may be third year, you're probably okay. If you're a fourth year right now, this is too late for you to think about. You should have already decided if you haven't talked to somebody quickly. Um, but if you're a first year or second year and you're, you're thinking about a surgical specialty, uh, what I advise my students to do is whenever you have time off, spring break, winter break, um, you know, two or three days here and there where you have, you have built in study time that you're not using, come into the operating room, hang out with us. I love doing that. And I challenge my medical students that I can convince you to become a urologist if you just spend me, will give me one day in the operating room. And it's because it's not because of me, but it, the atmosphere that we have in the urology operating room, that our teams, our pathology, robotic fancy surgery going on, everybody gets really excited about that. And when they see an infectious environment where people are being taught, where people are being engaged, they get attracted to that. So I think if you are thinking about a surgical specialty and you're a first year or second year medical student, then go spend some time before your clinical rotation start. And then when you start your clerkships, you know, you'll get a, an option to maybe do a urology selective or ENT selective, whatever, um, you know, uh, specialty work you want to do, then take advantage of that and then pursue it. My last advice is always to find a mentor, always, always, whether you have decided on a field, not decided on a field, find a mentor, get inspired by somebody, find qualities and people you want to emulate, and then go and do that. Um, and I think you'll find yourself to be very happy. I think when you become a doctor, you can probably, if you go back to your personal statement, when you were applying to medical school and you pick most fields in medicine, you'd be happy if you were true to what you actually signed up for. Um, almost most of us learned that late, like I did. I'm still learning why I actually became a doctor. Um, but if you go back to your statement, whether you pick ENT, urology, general surgery, family medicine, everything you said in your personal statement about why you want to be a doctor will probably be true. So it may not matter. So if you find happiness with a certain environment, with a certain pathology, emulating a certain mentor, I think that's where you should be focused. And Dr. Yates, why did you become a urologist? I, I realized, um, I'll, I'll admit first, that I, for a period of time, was the family medicine interest group leader at my medical school. Um, so clearly quite a dramatic shift um, in interest. And I realized that I my day-to-day, -day, what I saw my day-to-day -day becoming years down the road, um, needed to be a little more varied than what primary care could offer. Um, I didn't really enjoy being in the clinic as, and I thought I would really like, I thought that's what I was drawn to is the um, longitudinal relationships and just the day-to-day -day of seeing patients um, in a clinic setting. And I realized quickly that's not what I liked at all. So some of um, my decision-making was based just very generically on how I wanted my day-to-day -to, -day to look. And then what drew me to urology was just the variety of cases and the variety of subspecialties. And here we have, you know, someone going into pediatric urology, which is drastic different than what some of the rest of us do. And that's exciting that we have those options. Um, and I think the the third piece was just um, the people. It's there. It's a lot of great people. I don't think urologists take themselves too seriously. Um, so it's a lot of fun. I think it's just a good group of people and it just felt like the right fit for me. And Dr. Tadros, why did you become a urologist? Mostly dumb luck, I think. But uh, <laughs> uh, um, I, I, everything that everyone said is totally true. I think for me, uh, similar to Dr. Mirza, um, I found mentors that I just really wanted to be like in every possible way. Um, and I saw these urologists uh, as people that were just, they were having fun. They were really, they were some of the smartest, hardest working people I'd ever met. Uh, and yet they still had a good time. And especially coming from the general surgery world where I would hang out with the residents, you know, my general surgery co-residents, and we'd be bitching and moaning about everything. And then I remember switching to urology and going to like the first urology party and people are happy. And there's kids running around and people are laughing at their attendings and stuff. And I was just blown away by like, this is that this was possible to have in a, uh, with my colleagues and even to this day, you know, all my, most of my best friends are, are urologists um, because I think it's just a great group of people. So that, that was, 
that kind of cult of personality or whatever you want to call it was uh, was big for me. Maybe not the best way to pick a specialty, but um, it worked out for me. And then uh, the other thing is is the is the the work we get to do. I love uh, the breadth of stuff uh, as has been previously mentioned, um, and I think it's a great way to start and end a career. If when I was uh, in general surgery, you know, if you were going to be the big Whipple surgeon doing 12 to 20 hour cases, and that's all you did, when you're 65 and your back hurts, and you know you haven't spoken to your children or grandchildren for months because you're that's all you're doing, that's really difficult. In urology, um, you can do those big cases, and then as you get older, you could just do more clinic. You can do smaller endoscopic cases. You can do everything in between, and I love that variety and that ability to be able to tailor. Uh, my schedule uh, to my life as my career goes on. Wonderful answers. Well, we have time for just uh, maybe one question or two. And there was one post from the audience and I'm going to let whoever wants to take this one jump in. So the question is, uh, what are recommendations that we have for international graduates who want to apply for urology? Any takers? I'll take the first stab at it. It's a very, it's a, it's a difficult question. And the reason it's a difficult question is because if you look at the urology match, um, international medical graduates don't do well in the urology match. The match rate, it's a competitive specialty in general, even for US grads, but it's even more competitive and more difficult to match uh, when you're an international medical graduate. Um, and that's why this question becomes important. How what can an international medical graduate do differently than a U.S. graduate to stand out? I think some things are going to be the same. Like you need to have competitive step scores, even though two years later this may not be something you could do because it's pass fail. Um, you need to have good grades. You need to have good research experiences. You need to have good mentors. Often it helps international international medical graduates to come and do research fellowships, um, which are sometimes not even paid fellowships, unfortunately, um, to sort of get a foot in their door, to create relationships with mentors, to understand the system within the US, to even understand the match process. I think it's a difficult one to understand if you haven't gone through medical school here um, and you haven't really been in that environment. Um, and I think it, it boils down to personal relationships for international medical graduates. I think the ones that I have worked with that I've seen match are the ones who built strong relationships with the faculty within the departments that they work with, um, where they did their fellowship or where they rotated or, or some, some personal connection outside of the paper application that anyone can submit. Um, so try to establish those connections as best you can. Even that's difficult when you're you know, somewhere in Europe or Africa, it's, it's tough to have that connection, especially when it's COVID and you can't even travel to the United States. Um, but I think those are the things that can help you. There is a, I think, general reluctance um, for whatever reason, and it's not necessarily a negative thing or a, um, a racist thing or a biased thing, but there is a certain reluctance that we as program faculty members have when we're matching international medical graduates. Um, and it's, 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 it's because we don't know what we're getting, essentially. Even though we should know what we're getting, there's always that piece like, okay, what's gonna happen here if we mass this person? And what if we have an equally good candidate who is across the state line, why don't we match that applicant higher? And we would always favor that. And that, that makes sense. It's a, it's a reasonable choice to make because the known entity is better than what you can't figure out or don't know or don't want to know. Um, so it puts international medical graduates in a, in a difficult position, but I would encourage anybody who is listening as an international graduate, Try to establish relationships personally, directly, by rotations, by doing research work. And I think that's probably the, the best way to get your foot into the door outside of sort of the check boxes like step scores, grades, et cetera. Wonderful advice. Any other comments from the panel? I think, I think honestly, that that's some of the best advice. If you have an advocate that's going to help you get 
get to where you need to go, you you really win. And if you quickly start thinking about the places you want to apply, places that have had international medical graduates as residents, that's a good first step. But people calling and looking at your application and basically advocating for you. And if they get to know who you are, then your your personality will shine through and you'll really kind of stand above, especially with that added effort that a lot of our uh, international medical grads seem to have built in them. They seem to work, you know, twice as hard. And so I think if people get to know you, then that's, um, um, you know, that's, uh, that's really going to be something that that'll help you succeed. So I, we're almost out of time. This has been a wonderful experience. So I just want to thank all of our amazing faculty that have spent their evening with us so that we can tell you a little bit more about urology. Um, and we're going to bring up the slide, but we want you to join us at the medical student meet and greet in Las Vegas in person. So please come by. This is a great opportunity to mingle and meet some mentors in urology, people that are very interested in medical education. Um, so please stop by and I thank you so much for your time and joining us today um, and, and uh, have a wonderful rest of the evening.